You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Marim Nawazi. And I'm Fari Borspuya. In this week's program, we have an interview with Nora Mulready on anti-imperialist left. We'll also be talking about the ongoing migrant crisis, the Turkish government's ongoing attacks against the Kurdish population there, as well as Obama's mosque visit and insane fatwa and a wonderful highway of hope in Iraq. Stay with us. The ongoing migrant crisis is uh, still headline news. Uh, just a few days ago, there were reports of 40 to 70,000 Syrians fleeing towards the Turkish border. It is a mass exodus, basically, of millions of people trying to reach safety. And the, the tragedy of uh, humanity in, in um, Syria, it's amazing when you see the scenes of people actually physically, the whole you know, families packing the things and running away from the war front. It's, you know, it demands that the world needs to pay attention and uh, you know, save and protect people. People need refuge. Yeah, I mean, you hear about people saying, well, a lot of them are fake refugees. Many of them are economic migrants. Well, I, I would like to ask those people, have they seen photographs of what's happened to Syria? And it's like saying, you know, not all Jews had the right to flee from Hitler. A minority did. That's clearly not the case. There's a reason why they're fleeing and they need protection. And I think this is um, different parts of Syria and Turkey. We'll see that. Turkish government is uh, daily attacking the uh, uh, Kurdish areas and that's generating a lot of uh, um, people who've been displaced and, and this is something that the world needs to pay attention to and recognize refugees um, today. It's a, a major um, issue and not just not because of war. The, the, the world has changed. It's a global uh, environment um, and that's the effect of global globalization and we need to pay attention and protect people and these borders actually are very very oppressive. Yeah and there's obviously you know people are concerned about for example if there's enough resources for people and so on and so forth. There is if we put people's needs before profit and the reality is that we have faced mass migrations in the past, have been able to manage them, we need to be able to manage this as well, this uh, reality of the world that we live in today. I mean one of the issues that uh, recently hit the headline news and it was reported in the Times and the State Watch site actually published the um, the fact that the European Union is drawing up secretly draw, drawing up a plan to um, criminalize anybody who's supporting refugees fleeing. That's just unacceptable. Now, how could, on one hand, Europe uh, say and uh, in reality, to some extent, welcoming refugees? On the other hand, governments uh, conspire to criminalize normal people, human solidarity criminalize these activities. Yeah, and it's not only the criminalization of people who are trying to help refugees, but refugees themselves. I mean, there is a sort of criminalization of people who are trying to reach safety, equating them with terrorists, with, um, you know, rapists and so on and so forth. Whereas, in fact, a vast majority are just ordinary people who want to live a better life free from bombs and murder. I mean, just recently I heard in ISIS a teenager was beheaded merely because he didn't show up uh, to Friday prayers. You have people, um, you know, Kurds in Turkey being killed. You have people in Iran and Saudi Arabia being killed as a result of Sharia laws. Yeah. You know, there's real need here and it's not just Syrians. Absolutely. I think the issue of uh, refugees, it's very clear that people need protection and the world needs to pay attention to that. But the other issue is that to equate refugees with Islamist movement, a fascist movement, it actually distracts the world from paying attention to a real danger. That's an Islamic religious right-wing uh, movement. This is a distraction and we need to be able to, on the one hand, very clearly support the refugees. 
on the other very uh, clearly fight this lies. Yeah, and I mean, this, the problem is here is placing collective blame or looking at refugees as a homogenous grouping. Uh, it's in a way what the Islamists do too. They say everybody in the West is culpable and therefore they can bomb discotheques and buses and saying that all refugees are criminal is doing basically the same thing, saying everybody is to blame for the crimes of ISIS Absolutely. or the Assad regime yeah. and so on. I, yeah. um, I mean, uh, with uh, we, we do like to put uh, specific attention on what's happening in Turkey um, these these past weeks. Obviously, the Turkish government, it's a fascist government, it's an Islamist government, pure and simple, though it's a very close ally of the West. It has been placing curfews and uh, killing civilians in uh, Kurdish-populated uh, cities in Turkey itself. There's lots of reports of civilians being killed and not having access to medical care or ambulance services for many, many days. And this is a really Islamist government. You, you've seen that the Turkish government has changed over the years. It slowly, gradually uh, has moved more and more toward an Islamic, Islamic and Islamist state. And this is the result of what you, you, you know, Islamic government would do. The wonderful poet and singer Shahi Najafi, who has a death fatwa against him by the Iranian regime, has uh, said something really wonderful about uh, what's happening in Turkey. And one of his things that he said is that the voice of Kobani uh, was raised uh, throughout the world. And now, uh, with the sweet business between Turkey and Western governments, silently they are being slaughtered. And I think it's important to always remember uh, what you know the, the fact that we've been defending and uh, you know uh, feeling so hopeful because of the resistance uh, by Kurdish uh, forces in Kobani for example we have to also make sure that we show our solidarity and put pressure on the Turkish government to stop killing Kurds in its own country um, as well yeah. and you know this comes to the fact that you know you, you do see a lot of Western governments really messing things up badly they have close relations with the Turkish government the Saudi government and so on and so forth and they're always making excuses for Islam and Islamism you know uh, let's talk uh, about Obama visiting no, absolutely. a mosque <laughs> I mean, there's one issue there's one narrative and rhetoric of saying human rights and uh, fight against bigotry if you want to fight fight against bigotry you must fight against Islamism you can't fight against bigotry and go into a mosque and defend Islam as a center of segregation I mean that that's just um, it's shocking to some extent I'll see Obama going to say you know in a mosque to say uh, um, you know effectively defending Islam, saying there's, there's no problem with Islam. And I think that that's really uh, mixes things up and that's not helpful. I think Asra Nomani wrote a very good piece about how, you know, the mosque that he visited is segregated according to gender and how separation is never equal, as was very clear in the civil rights movement. It also applies to gender issues. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that Islam can be criticized. Islamism must be opposed unequivocally uh, that doesn't mean you have to defend one or the other in order to defend Muslims and human beings. The insane fatwa of this week is from Pakistan's Council of Islamic Ideology. And the chairman, who is Maulana Muhammad Khan Shirani, he has a really mm. long name. Put another Maulana at the end. <laughs> <laughs> he has said, basically, under questions of whether the blasphemy law can be changed, he's like, go ahead, you know, it's fine. You, you're welcome to review it. You just can't change or amend it at all. What's the point of reviewing? Well, just so you feel good about yourself, that you're you're reviewing something. Responding but, to people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just review, and but don't change. It's like, let's just review the stoning laws, but you can't change it. Let's just review gender segregation, but you can't change it's it. There's a bit of pressure there, isn't it? <laughs> I think they, they feel the pressure. There's people don't definitely want. Pre pressure, but basically they're saying what every good old Molana or Sheikh or Imam will say is that we decide and we're not changing anything that's inhuman. Let's just get rid of it, shall we? <laughs> I think so, yeah. A few weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Nora Mulready, 
she is a Labour Party activist and I spoke to her about the sort of left that uh, sides with Islamists and is anti-imperialist and only anti-imperialist. Listen to what she has to say in this very interesting interview. Thank you, Nora, for joining us. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about a large section of the left in Britain, in Europe, Uh, It seems uh, very much so that this has become a left that has turned its back on traditional left values, Uh, you know, internationalism, women's equality, and so on and so forth. Why do you think we've come to a place where this is so? Mm. I mean, that's a, you know, obviously a big question. Um, I think, from what I can kind of see, it, if you look... It was born out of some of the great uh, campaigns for liberation from the 60s, you know, in Britain, across Europe and America, which were, you know, championing, um, you know, anti-racism, you know, protection of minorities, you know, all of those things that were absolutely right and really, really good. Um, But as the years have gone by, it's kind of morphed from being about the protection of people from minorities into the protection of cultures, so things that the original left might have said, well, actually, you know, we're not sure we support that that type of practice or whatever, um, which then went a step further and became the protection of almost political ideologies that were espoused by people who kind of wore a protective shield of being from a minority. And I guess the most obvious example of that is, is Islamism and the relationship between the left and Islamism today, which is, you know weirdly they're weirdly connected um and that's a real shame but i think it's that i think it's that journey where it's just it was a good thing and then it just over the years became distorted and now it's barely unrecognizable barely recognizable so i mean it's so contradictory to have a left supporting islamism which Mm. is a far-right movement how you know how can that be explained uh, as something progressive beyond what you've Mm. said how can people sort of you know, accept that mm. in their daily politics? I think the, at the heart of it is, is cultural relativism. I think it, you know, that, that is the only conceivable explanation for it, that the idea of um, something being part of someone's culture is, is, more impo- is a more important thing to kind of protect than it, it being wrong. Um, you know, and, and so the kind of the instinct, the left wing instinct to, to protect is just misdirected. You know? So, um, uh, I mean, we've had maybe 20, maybe 30 years of like university students, left wing students who, you know, as I say, it started from a really good place of, of, of the liberation campaigns. But over the years, with each new intake of university students, there, there's another kind of mini generation of the left that's being totally immersed in this idea that it's their culture is more important than it's wrong. And over time, it's actually become almost part of the DNA of the left. You know, these are people who, yes, they may have come to this when they were 18, 19, but they're now in their 30s, 40s, even 50s. And it's, it's very... It strikes me that it's going to be incredibly hard to to turn to turn the left in a new direction or in an old direction um, because it's so deeply ingrained now it's, it's you know it's a profound change um, in the psychology of, of the left isn't it worrying especially now with Jeremy Corbyn as head of the leader Par- Labour Party Seamus Milner for example mm. uh, having a key role it seems that this is becoming more mainstream is that possible Well, I think it might be more mainstream, hopefully temporarily, um, within the Labour Party. I don't think it's becoming more mainstream within the country. Um, I think what we're seeing at the moment is a, a, a fringe element of the left has basically hijacked the Labour Party at the moment. Um... You know, and and groups that had virtually no support across the country, you know, even in the last set of elections, have now basically kind of been o- the doors have been opened up to them. Unfortunately, by Jeremy Corbyn's um, leadership success, um, 
you know, and now they're doing everything they can to try and kind of use the Labour Party as the vehicle for their kind of politics. But there is a huge backlash within the Labour Party, and actually, I think within Labour supporting communities across the country against that kind of politics. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure it's going to kind of sustain over the long term. But it is going to be hard to to challenge it. It is going to be hard to challenge it. And the, the thing is, I guess there's a contradiction because a lot of people feel that they want to support many of uh, Jeremy Corbyn's good policies mm. against austerity and defence of refugee rights. Mm. And on the other hand, there's this thing, you know, this relationship with Islamism as well um, that seems to be contradictory. I mean, you can't be anti-fascist just some of the time, you know. Mm. Um, how, how, is, how, how can one address this? Because um, some will say, well, the relations with Islamists is only a small part of the, the bigger picture. Would you agree with that? Well, except that it's it seems to be born out of a kind of global analysis that everything wrong that happens in the world is the fault of the West. And it's a kind of... You know, and obviously, like, you know, international relations and world affairs and history is very complicated. And there's an awful lot of things that intertwine. And you could never say, well, actually, if that didn't happen, none of the rest of this stuff would happen. Or if only we'd done that, you know, there would be a different outcome. It's complicated. Everything's complicated. Um, but the but they seem to have what they come to one conclusion. Everything has every, all roads lead to, uh, you know, the West is to blame. So it's not just about Islamism, it's actually something far more fundamental in, in that aspect of the left's world view. So I don't think it is a small thing. I think it's actually, it's a symptom of something very fundamental to the entire of their politics. So I don't, I, I, I think, and I don't think people will, people, I don't think people will kind of tolerate it, actually. I mean, we certainly won't, won't be elected to government anytime soon with these politics. So even if people within the Labour Party might kind of tolerate it for a bit longer, because we have no choice at the moment, um, the, the country won't, won't elect it. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Nora Mulready. I think she raises some really important points. As someone who is on the left myself, I am so fed up with this section of the left. And of course, it's not all of the left. There are many people on the left who are pro-universal rights, anti-Islamist and anti-US militarism and imperialism and so on and so forth, but fed up with this left that sides with the Islamists at all costs and is also culturally relative, doesn't care about rights anymore, doesn't care about citizens, only cares about defending Islam and Islamism. I think Nora's interview is part and parcel of that reclaiming the narrative of the left. Um, and we, we, we've seen at least in the last um, a few years, a lot of people have raised a voice against that Occidentalist, really, the anti-Western, uh, pro-nationalist, historically now pro-Islamist um, left, that they, the only thing is important for them is anybody who's against the West and they'll be in bed with them. I would say that that's the part of narrative of reclaiming that, um, reclaiming that left and progressive and libertarian ground for you know, for, for society, and that's important voice that needs to be heard. The slice of life this week is from Iraq, Baghdad, a highway which has been called the Highway of Death because of the amounts of people who have been killed on it, was turned into a road for hope when 2,000 men and women from Iraq and the Middle East joined together to go for a jog. And when you look at the picture, you'll see the, you know, the, the glory of Iraqi um, society actually bubbling and coming out. Put this next to the scenes of demonstrations earlier last uh, late in last year and uh, thousands and upon thousands of people came out on demonstration on a number of days demanding secularism and that's that's beauty so actually to, to support a uh, change in Iraqi society we need to back this movement rather than going to the mosque mm -hmm. and pretend that we are defending the other
Yeah, definitely. And I think the wonderful thing about this, it was called a marathon. Obviously, it was a lot shorter than a marathon, given the circumstances. But the theme was love and hope. And I think it is these sorts of scenes that give us hope for the future. It's these people, these very people who are, you know, bringing about a sort of change and who are saying that we need a different world, one in which we can jog on a highway that was once called the highway of death. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. We look forward to seeing you every week, as I hope you look forward to seeing us every week. Until next week, have a wonderful time. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.